good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on the coast uh, on which you exist. Um, welcome uh, to ABC's The Association of Black Cardiologists, uh, newest installation of the Table Talk series entitled uh, Mission Possible, Preventing Heart Disease Early On. This is a program that is expertly produced um, by the ABC Women and Children's uh, Committee. I could not think of a more fitting title um, for this Table Talk series at this juncture in history during Black History Month and Heart Month. Certainly, we know that heart disease does not begin in adulthood, but actually begins in childhood. And with ABC's slogan of saving the hearts and minds of a diverse America, it means that we must begin to save the hearts and minds of a diverse America at the earliest opportunities possible by, as you'll hear during this program, uh, decreasing the chances of obesity and high blood pressure, which are among the leading risk factors for cardiovascular disease and other conditions, including cancer, as adults. I want to thank the co-hosts of our program, uh, the co-chairs of the Women and Children's ABC Committee, Drs. Anna Ansong, who's a pediatric cardiologist, and Dr. Rachel Bond, who is a adult uh, general cardiologist, as well as Dr. Vanessa Oguri, who is a pediatric cardiology fellow at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. I also want to thank our guests um, for their willingness uh, to be part of this very, very important program. Given that it is also, uh, as I mentioned, Black History Month and Heart Month, I want to remind the audience that ABC also has a campaign that actually focuses on a part of the life course, um, which is maternal health, um, which does include um, preconceptual health, as well as health into um, the uh, older and elderly stages of life. Our campaign, please check out our campaign called We Are the Faces of Black Maternal Health on the OWN network or uh, on Oprah.com, as well as on wearethefaces.abcardio.org. This is going to be an amazing program. Pivoting over to you, uh, Dr. Ansong. Yes, thank you, Dr. Albert. Good evening, everyone. We started the Table Talk series to highlight the spectrum of cardiovascular disease from childhood to women in their reproductive years to mature postmenopausal women. We also sought to highlight the disparities that can occur to women and children seeking cardiovascular care. It is our hope that you'll find the series educational, engaging, and empowering. Mission Possible, Preventing Heart Disease Early On, seeks to spotlight one of the biggest risk factors for heart disease seen at epidemic levels in children, obesity. Without further ado, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Vanessa O'Guri, Pediatric Cardiology Fellow at Children's National Hospital, for the introduction of our esteemed panelists. Dr. O'Guri, over to you. Hello there, everyone. Um, welcome. It's a pleasure to see all of our guests here today. Um, again, my name is Vanessa Aguirre. I'm a current uh, pediatric cardiology fellow here in Washington, D.C., and I have the uh, pleasure of introducing some of our esteemed guests tonight. Um, first, we would like to start off by inter introducing Dr. Uh, Rachel Bond. Again, she is one of the co-chairs of the Women and Children's Committee here tonight, but we are also very pleased to have her here as a guest. Um, a little brief biography of Dr. Bond. She's a board-certified attending cardiologist who has devoted 
her career to the treatment of heart disease through early detection, education, and prevention. She's the system director of women's heart health at Dignity Health in Arizona. She's also the co-chair, as Afra mentioned, um, in the Women in Children um, Cardiology Committee, um, as well as the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Arizona chapter of the American College of Cardiology. She had most recently been appointed to serve on the Women in Cardiology Section Leadership Council for the National Chapter of the American College of Cardiology, holds a faculty position as Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine at Creighton University School of Medicine. She did attend um, a seven-year accelerated medical program at Sophie Davis, um, also my alma mater, um, where she transitioned um, to achieve her medical doctorate from NYU and completed her internal medicine training um, at NYU, um, followed by um, her residency at North Shore LIJ. She is the author of several review papers, um, primarily referencing sex and gender differences, as well as cardiovascular conditions that predominantly affect women, along with uh, multiple opinion pieces aimed at addressing health equity, um, reducing health disparities, and promoting the professional development of, of women and minorities in the health science profession. She has a passion for advocacy and has advised as an expert source through news and media outlets. Um, she is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and a member of the American Society for Preventative Cardiology, Association of Black Cardiologists, and the American Heart Association, where it, she is a national spokesperson for the Go Red for Women campaign and sits on the board of directors. Thank you so much, Dr. Bond, for joining us. Um, next, I would love uh, to introduce our next um, speaker. Um, panelist who is a preventative cardiologist here, Dr. Michelle Mieta Snyder. She's a preventative cardiologist right here um, in Washington, D.C. Um, she's a clinical research scientist and director of Children National Hospital's Bioenergetic Energetic Significant Interest Group. Um, clinically, um, she staffs our preventative cardiology clinic here and provides cardiology consultation to her, our colleagues here in the ideal weight management clinic. She works closely um, with surgical colleagues, offers medical support to the bariatric surgical program, and she's developing adjunct mobile health tools to reinforce clinical behavior counseling. From a community perspective, she has initiated um, a novel academic community collaboration with DC public schools, as well as the George Washington University medical students since 2012 to bring mentored behavior change model into elementary and middle, middle schools, as well as to strengthen um, local school wellness policies. In terms of her research, she has multi-site co uh, collaborations that advocate for children's health, promote uh, promotion through the um, National Association of Children's Hospitals, uh, and she's funded by the NIDDK as well as the NIH, um, primarily focused on um, obesity in teens, um, and her resolve to promote um, a healthy uh, lifestyle um, is really clear in all of her clinical endeavors. Um, next, we have Dr. Klaus, um, who is also a pediatric preventative cardiologist here. Um, she joined Children's National Hospital in 20, 2002. She received her bachelor's from Cornell um, and earned her medical degree in SUNY Buffalo. Uh, she completed her pediatric residency at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, she was also a pediatric cardiology fellow at Johns Hopkins. She specializes in fetal echocardiology at echocardiography, excuse me, single ventricle heart management, as well as dyslipidemias. She is the director of our single ventricle program here. Um, and she's part of the Joint Council on Congenital Heart Disease. Um, we are pleased to have you here as well. Um, next, we have Eleanor Mackey, Dr. Eleanor Mackey. She's a pediatric psychologist and associate professor of psychology at Children's National. Um, her work focuses mainly on the health and well being of children, as well as families with chronic illnesses, including obesity, type 2 diabetes, and type 1 diabetes. She's passionate about reducing health disparities through addressing structural inequities in our communities and in the healthcare field. Um, she oversees 
uh, psychological services for children and adolescents receiving bariatric surgery here at Children's National. And she currently has multiple research grants evaluating mindfulness-based interventions in improving health in youth and at risk um, for type 2 diabetes and those with type 1 diabetes. Next, we have joining us um, is Ms. Angelo Bodu. Um, she is a registered dietitian and is the clinical nutrition manager here at Children's National. She's been with the hospital since 2012. Uh, she received her bachelor's in, uh, diet in dietitian from the University of Mar Maryland and then went on to complete her uh, internship in 2011. She has completed her certificate of training in childhood and adolescent weight management and is also a member of the Academy of Nutrition and its weight management dietary practice group. Um, next we have um, on our docket today um, is Ms. Uh, Quinn Whitaker. Um, she's a a uh, senior executive leader with a broad base of over 35 years of experience in the intelligence community. Um, she founded a uh, uh, mosaic a firm um, and served as the CEO for over 10 years. Um, Moving forward, she ended up opening um, Educational Green Fair Organic Cafe, um, whose purpose is delivering a 21-day program from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Um, over 1,000 people, including three dozen medical professionals and senior leaders from the intelligence community have completed this program, um, and many doctors refer to this program. Um, in July of 2019, she founded Green Fair Health and Wellness to provide integrated and holistic healthcare practice for nutrition, traditional medicine, yoga, massage, exercise, and meditation with plant-based partners. Um, and she organizes the, Fair, the Fairfax Vegetable Fest with senior team of volunteers. Um, and she's really has shown a commitment um, to being an environmentalist. Um, her organic uh, certified cafe um, pays a living wage, uses renewable energy and compostable products. Um, she has had talks at Google Federal, Amazon, and the AARP um, regarding the nutritional benefits of a plant-based journey, as well as how we can um, lower our environmental impact. Um, and next, we have Dr. Wally Gobin, who is a board-certified pediatric cardiologist. Um, he has a passion for nutrition and physical fitness. He started a private uh, cardiology practice um, and has is the founder of the Healthy Heart Program. The program primarily focuses on childhood obesity and associated comorbidities. He works with families creating nutrition and physical fitness plans. And last, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Uh, Yolanda Lewis Raglan, who is a double board certified physician in pediatrics and obesity, owner and CEO of Family Fitness and Wellness for Community Health and founder of Dr. Yolanda Cares Foundation. Her nonprofit organization focuses on reducing health uh, disparities in at-risk communities at home and abroad. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of our talk again today. Um, and it will be a really great pleasure to hear from all of you. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello, everyone again. And thank you, panelists as well. So I want you all to meet Carla. Carla is a 25-year-old Black woman pregnant with her first child. She's sad. She just finished an appointment with her OB where she was told she's a high-risk pregnancy. Her risk factors include her obesity and her high blood pressure. Dr. Bond, as an adult preventative cardiologist and leading advocate for Black maternal health, what red flags jump out at you immediately? Oh, thank you so much. And I actually um, am honored to be the only adult cardiologist on this panel today. Um, so first, I think it's important that we define what a high-risk pregnancy is. And when we think about a high-risk pregnancy, we know that it means that 
either the woman or their child is at risk of having health complications or more so having actual premature labor or early labor. And when we look at Carla in particular, with the risk factors you included, which are obesity and high blood pressure, those are really two of the most common risk factors that lead to high risk or possible high risk complications during pregnancy. If we actually think about the United States as a whole, the United States is the only developed country to date that still has rising rates of poor complications during pregnancy, specifically death from pregnancy. And it's not just pregnancy, it's up to one year after they actually deliver. And when we actually look at the leading cause, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, the brain and the heart in particular are leading the way. We know that um, when it comes to women of color in particular, there are rising rates in the number of women that are suffering from obesity as well as from high blood pressure. And as a result, black women are two to three times more likely to die during pregnancy as compared to their white female counterparts. But those risk factors are not the only reason why we're seeing these disparities. As it stands right now, we know that women in particular, specifically Black women, are facing these disparities across all income and educational levels. And a large portion of it has to do with psychosocial stressors, including racism, such as the structural racism that we as um, with people of color specifically encounter on day-to-day -day experiences. Now, when we think about the risk factors that we are focusing on for Carla, obesity, and more importantly, high blood pressure. We know that high blood pressure is extraordinarily common in people of color, specifically black people, in that we know that one in two people, specifically black women above the age of 20, have some form of heart disease and the leading cause is actually high blood pressure. And as it stands, despite awareness being greater, unfortunately, we're not doing as good a job in controlling it. And as a result, black women are dying at younger and younger ages, or they're having more severe forms of disease that could potentially transition during their pregnancy to complications. And Carla being, you know, after 20 weeks gestation with her blood pressure now being problematic, it is concerning that she has a condition that's either what we define to be gestational, meaning during pregnancy, high blood pressure, or something like another condition called preeclampsia. What preeclampsia is, is when the blood pressure becomes very elevated and it could actually affect the organs. It can lead to spilling protein in the urine and it could affect the brain, it could affect the heart and it could affect all of the vital organs of our body. And it's very severe at times to the point that the only treatment for it may be delivery. A lot of times preeclampsia can lead to that premature labor. And that's something that we wanna avoid. Now, right now we know that black women who specifically have complications during their pregnancy, not just preeclampsia, but perhaps diabetes during their pregnancy, perhaps premature labor are about two times more likely to suffer a stroke and heart attack. They're also about four times more likely after their pregnancy to transition to full blown high blood pressure in the future. So what happens during our pregnancy is really a window to our health in the future. But even to that point, we talk a lot about looking at the particular patient across the lifespan. We know that children who are born to mothers who have had preeclampsia or other high blood pressure disorders of pregnancy, they actually are at a greater likelihood of having high blood pressure as well as obesity. So for Carla, it would be important that we maybe look at what her mother's maternal risk factors were. Did she have preeclampsia? Did she have any elevated blood pressure? And is that making her more prone to have it? It also is important because her current baby that she's uh, pregnant with, it's important that we know, or at least that she is aware that this does place that child at a higher risk in the future of having issues with their blood pressure and possibly their weight as well. And when we think about young adults, close to a third with high blood pressure were born again to mothers who had high blood pressure during pregnancy. So I can't emphasize enough that what happens during our pregnancy 
can impact our future self. And it's also important to highlight that what happens during our childhood could impact our future self, because we know that Black women are first Black girls. So what we really need to be focusing in on, which is such a pivotal part of what the mission for this seminar today and this webinar today was, is to talk about what we can do as children to hopefully prevent outcomes that we're seeing, not just during pregnancy, but in general. And prevention is such an important part because as this infographic very nicely demonstrates, maternal mortality, maternal death is something we could prevent 60% of the time, but cardiovascular disease as a whole is something we could prevent 80% of the time. And a lot of that is by knowing what your risks are, blood pressure, diabetes, um, obesity, making sure you're avoiding smoking and drinking alcohol in excess and being physically active and eating a well-balanced heart healthy diet. That's what prevents heart disease. So a condition like this is something we could prevent. And that's why for Carla, it may be important that we delve a little deeper into what her family history was, but more importantly, what her own condition may impact herself, but also her future child. Thank you so much, Dr. Bond, for that response. Um, so going back to uh, Carla and her story, she ponders and she recalls always being a big girl um, from when she was a young child. All the women in her family um, are always referred to as a little sick. Um, why is this now a problem? Her family did not make it an issue ever as she was growing up. Um, what could have been done differently back then? Um, we're going to turn this now to you, Dr. Mieta Snyder, um, as a preventative um, pediatric cardiologist. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking what is obesity, what are its causes, and uh, its risk factors for heart disease? Thank you, Vanessa. I. Um can answer the question simply, but it's not simple. Uh, we've all heard more calories in than calories burned or calories out causes obesity. And that's true, but it's not the whole truth um, because it's never quite that simple. There's so many things that affect both sides of that equation. On the calories inside, for example, what kind of food energy we eat matters as much or sometimes more than the absolute number of calories. One example um, is that fruit sugar in an orange that's been squeezed and the pulp thrown out and taken in as orange juice will flood our body much faster than the same fruit sugar eaten in the original orange, simply because the fiber or the pulp in the whole fruit slows down how fast the sugar enters to a pace the body can keep up with. Fast sugar is particularly hard on the body. On the calories outside, our age, our muscle mass, level of physical activity, our overall metabolic health affect how efficiently we're gonna use food energy, however fast it comes in. So there's lots of moving parts to the equation and that balance of energy in, energy out has to occur every single time we eat, usually several times a day. A little bit of stored extra energy um, you know, if we end up a little above or a little below the balance, it's not a problem. A little extra is, is actually healthy. Uh, fat is not a four letter word. It's like a savings account to keep us going between meals, especially longer fasts, like every night when we go to sleep. But with food energy relatively easy to come by in the world we live in, and particularly lower quality food energy, processed foods that are calorie rich and nutrient poor and, and a life that often keeps us at a desk job, more sedentary, digital tools taking over our life. It's easy to store more fat than is healthy. And more and more people now up to half of the whole world and two thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese, um, more weight, than is healthy for their height. Do you want me to go on to the next question, Vanessa? 
Sure. I think that um, one other thing that I think would be important to uh, add into this picture are thinking about what are the overall long term and short term effects of well, obesity. I will, yeah, the, let me go back then. I wasn't sure if I would go question by question, but, but I've been asked, you know, what causes obesity, but also why is it a risk factor for heart disease, even in children? In other words, what is it about the excess fat storage that makes us sick? And it may sound backward at the beginning, but we actually get sick when we don't have enough normal fat cells to store the extra calories. So we've exceeded the calories we can burn and we've run out of space to put them in proper storage in adipose another word for fat, adipose cells. Every body for both hereditary and environmental reasons has a relatively fixed number of fat cells or adipose tissue. And you can think of it like a home. Every home has a fixed amount of closet space. Stuff accumulates and when there's not enough closet space, it will spill over onto the dining room table, maybe on the floor, pretty much any empty counter making clutter, and then clutter can become a problem. We can't find things, it's harder to stay organized. The body is a little like this. We have a fixed amount of storage space for excess fat when we exceed calories that we can burn. And when that capacity is exceeded, the fat goes rogue. The body will put it wherever it can to protect us. It'll put it in places that the body is not designed to hold fat, not equipped for it places like the liver, maybe you've heard of conditions called fatty liver, or the pancreas, where it can mess with the cells that make insulin and contribute to diabetes, or around heart muscle and in our blood vessels causing a disease we know of as atherosclerosis. That's what leads to heart attacks and strokes. In fact, fat that gets stored in a non-fat tissue is toxic. Another word for fat is lipids, so this condition is also called lipotoxicity, and it leads to insulin resistance that makes it hard for the hormone insulin to work properly in our body. Lipotoxicity and insulin resistance are what makes us sick. That's what makes obesity a disease. And unfortunately, it, it can happen whenever the capacity for healthy fat storage is exceeded, even in children. And in adolescents, as we saw in Carla's presentation, as a 16 year old, when she already was developing insulin resistance. We can infer that on the basis of the acanthosis, the darkening at the back of her neck, that's a sign of insulin overworking in the body and her complications of hypercholesterolemia and hypertension at 16 years of age. Um, some people are affected more than others. Why? Because their body's closet space is relatively hardwired our normal fat storage capacity is pretty much set up before we're born, before we've made our first lifestyle choice. And we can see this in how people carry their weight, whether it's more in the hips, which is generally healthy fat tissue, or more centrally in the midsection that suggests fat is building up in non-fat tissues like the liver or the abdomen. We're still learning why this happens differently in different people. Some Genes responsible for making healthy fat cells may simply not be working properly, either because of mutations in the DNA itself or changes in the scaffolding that protects the DNA. Probably more so those changes in scaffolding, and those are important because those are triggered by environmental stress. That could include an unhealthy diet, sedentary lifestyle that's stressful for the body, but also psychosocial stressors as already was mentioned by Dr. Bond. And then there's a whole nother set of important genes that influence our body's capacity to burn energy in the domain of our mitochondria, the powerhouses inside our human cells that make our energy. We need to mind our mitochondria. They don't do well when they're overloaded with processed food or simple sugar calories. But even if we've inherited mitochondria that aren't working optimally, we can improve their function with healthy food and exercise. You asked specifically about short and longer term effects. Short term, as you can imagine from what we've already explained, energy gets undermined. 
we won't be able to fight off infections as well, like COVID, anything that comes our way. And we won't, we just won't feel as great as we should. We won't have energy to exercise, even if we want to. Longer term, the lipotoxicity and insulin resistance associated with obesity accelerates progression to all the diseases Dr. Bond already mentioned. The diseases we'd like to associate with aging, but they're incurring uh, risk on our population early and earlier. Diseases like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, fatty liver, polycystic ovarian syndrome and infertility, atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, even Alzheimer's, the list goes on, but importantly, they're largely preventable conditions. The like the Sorry, doctors. Are there, and to add to that, are there certain populations that you would say are affected more than others and why? Just to piggyback. Well, the, those risk factors, those predisposing genetic factors that set people up for insulin resistance are more common in persons of Hispanic ancestry, South Asian ancestry, and African American ancestry. But it can occur in everybody, um, and it's not an absolute, um, but, um, but definitely the risk is more common for reasons that are both hereditary and environmental. Um, the, uh, when, the, when the risk presents early in childhood, there is a high likelihood that it will carry on through adulthood, but not an absolute likelihood. Um, the important take home is that we don't choose the genetic hand we're dealt at birth. There are going to be some strong cards, maybe some less so, but we play that hand and can either aggravate or lessen the risk we inherit with our lifestyle choices, hopefully with a healthy support system. The, um, the last question that I was charged with was what are the options for obesity treatment? And I think you can hear from the way I've answered the questions already that I'm an ardent believer in the power of a healthy lifestyle to promote heart health, to maximize, genes are not destiny, to maximize the function of our hereditary um, gifts and just have good energy all around. But I'm gonna leave the details of that question to be addressed by colleagues on the panel this evening who have tremendous expertise and I know shared passion for the power of nutrition and lifestyle to promote good health. Thank you, Dr. Mita Snyder. That was great. And you foretold uh, Carla's future here because um, we're back to Carla and she's curious and decides to look at her medical records from her youth. At 16 years of age, she had a BMI of 34, blood pressure of 130 over 90. There's also a note by her pediatrician at the time of something called acanthosis nigricans. With further perusing, she sees the word high for a total cholesterol of 230. There's a referral to an ideal clinic. Her doctor also writes in her notes, social issues in the family. Carla recalls at this age, this was a time of great challenge for her family. Her father lost his job and she went to live with her grandmother for a period of time. Her grandmother did not drive and relied on public transportation. She was not much of a cook either, and Carla remembers eating out a lot. The neighborhood was not the greatest, so Carla spent a lot of time indoors. Dr. Klaus, as a pediatric preventive cardiologist in a densely populated urban area for a number of years, what stands out to you about Carla's numbers and situation at 16 years of age? Can her numbers be reversed? Okay, um, so yeah, thank you again for inviting me to be here tonight. There's so much with Carla as we look back on her history when she was growing up, um, and we can go step by step here. So first of all, she was overweight uh, when she was younger with a BMI of 34. Uh, we're definitely seeing in our clinics right now a lot more obesity uh, than we did pre-pandemic. I have to say things are getting a little bit back more back to normal, and I have seen some improvements with the kids. But I always, you know, told the, my patients in the office that perhaps we couldn't count just normal day-to-day -day walking to the bus stop, walking to, in the school as, as physical activity. And, you know, what we've seen is that it actually did count uh, for some physical activity as just 
Lots of kids were such uh, very sedentary during the pandemic, going from their bed to their desk, or maybe not even to their desk for, for virtual school. They just didn't move at all, and have, they gained a lot of weight, and um, their lipids also went up. Um, and we saw that due to lack of activity and a lot more snacking uh, because they were in the house. Um, we also see that Carla's blood pressure was quite high as a youngster uh, at 16. Um, and that's when we know that blood pressure tracks over time so that if you have high blood pressure as a teenager, you're more likely to have high blood pressure as an adult. Also her cholesterol is high. So this is, a, I presume, a total cholesterol. What I tell all my patients when they come in to see me in the office, I'd like to know the individual numbers. Um, and that's something that I'd like the parents to know as well, because they often will tell me what their, they think their cholesterol is. And again, you need to know your specific numbers because this total cholesterol number is actually a combination of your good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, uh, the LDL cholesterol, and your triglycerides. So in order for me to help treat you with um, diet and exercise, and sometimes medications, I need to know exactly which cholesterol uh, is, is the main problem. Um, also, we saw as early as age 16 also that she had markings of insulin resistance that some of the other colleagues have talked about. So uh, concern for developing diabetes. Um, and we also know that um, stress, uh, both phys physical and psychological stress can um, lead to um, accelerating heart disease. So having her father lose the job um, was obviously a, a lot of stress. And then she was forced to move in with her grandmother, eating out, which is always a problem uh, that food is laden with salt and fats. Um, and so, you know, generally I try to encourage much more home cooking than eating out, uh, but knowing that families need to eat out sometimes. So we will work with them to try and help pick the healthiest choices uh, when they do, when they do go eat out. Um, so we can see early on that she had problems with, with stress, obesity, insulin resistance. Dr. Klaus, what should parents be asking their pediatricians when they have their yearly annual checkups for their kids? Yeah. So I would encourage families to talk to their pediatricians about just knowing their kids' numbers. So what exactly is the blood pressure? What is normal blood pressure? Because often for younger kids, um, the, you know, the blood pressure is different than what we expect it to be as an adult. So you know, we shouldn't be taking our, our, our you know, school age kids, kids that are under fifth grade and saying, okay, their blood pressure is normal if it's what my blood pressure is because their blood pressure needs to be lower. So know what the numbers are for your kids, but ask what the normal numbers are for kids that, that particular age is. Also ask your pediatrician to make sure they check the, their kids' cholesterol. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Heart Association recommends checking the lipids between ages nine and 11. So make sure your pediatrician does, does check the cholesterol in that um, age range or sooner if there's other risk factors. So if there's a family history of high cholesterol, family history of early heart disease, if your child's obese or has other risk factors like diabetes or other medical problems. Um, I oft also want parents to ask family members what, what the history is. You know, most, a lot of parents don't know what their parents have, what medications they're on. And so you need to communicate that to your pediatrician so that they can screen for whatever diseases might actually run in the family. And then the last thing I just, you know, have parents talk and model good behavior. So making sure that the parents are eating good food and doing exercise and doing all the behaviors that we want our kids to do, the parents need to do as well. Thank you, Dr. Klaus. Thank you so much, Dr. Klaus. Um, Getting back to Carla's story, um, Carla begins to recall periods of sadness. Um, and particularly, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Klaus, as um, we are currently in the pandemic, um, I wanna turn the conversation to Dr. Mackey, as we've talked about the physical and the metabolic effects of obesity. Uh, but Dr. Mackey, um, as a psychologist, um, looking at Carla and her home situation, um, how do you think her social dynamics or social dynamics in general play into obesity? Thank you so much. Um, I think it was really fun hearing Dr. Klaus talk because I think as a pediatric cardiologist, she really has her finger on the pulse too of um, how important it is to think about the whole child. 
And I think that that's really important. Um, you know, we focus a lot on the individual child and what is going on in their bodies and in their homes. Um, but I think it's really important to, to see that person in their context and, and what's going on. So for instance, I think as you can see from Carla's story, she has so much that she's dealing with. Um, and that is true for a lot of children of color. Structural racism has contributed to so many systems in our country and our society and healthcare system that make it really difficult to achieve good health and contribute to a lot of the inequities we see. Because if you take Carla, you see someone who's um, family has had job insecurity, who lives in an area that might not be as physically secure, who has to rely on public transportation, those things all make it so much more difficult um, to actually achieve good health. And having some of that back and forth between homes and some of that um, insecurity can really contribute to difficulties that kids might experience. Um, we also know that stress in families and generational trauma literally lives in the body and can increase risk for depression. And we know that depression is related to how the body handles insulin and risk for type two diabetes. I think that that is so true. Can you delve a little bit uh, more into um, what you believe the mindset of children who are uh, affected by obesity is like and what steps do you use to combat, combat some of these negative emotions? I think that that's really helpful to, to think about what this is like for kids. And um, when you think about how, um, you know, we have this impression in our society that obesity is really a, an a personal problem, that there's somehow some failing of the individual or the parents that they have just not taken care of themselves, that they don't care, that they don't try. Um, and especially when, when we understand that in the bigger context, very few factors could contribute to obesity as we've been hearing are actually under an individual's control. So if you think about what these kids are hearing over and over again, that there's something wrong with them, there's a lot of stigma around weight and appearance. Um, we live in a society that still has very much of this thin ideal norm. Um, and so we end up seeing that these kids carry a lot of shame and feelings of um, embarrassment and sadness and stigma. And that's really hard. Those are difficult messages. So we often see kids who struggle with anxiety, particularly social anxiety, because they're afraid of being judged. And in reality, they are often judged. So they have these lived experiences of being judged for who they are, what they're eating, and that creates a lot of a lot of problems. I've had a lot of kids say to me, for instance, um, you know, skipping meals is a real problem. You really do have to eat regularly to maintain your metabolism, and they won't eat at all during the school day because they're afraid to have people see them eat and judge them for what they eat. And so you can see that there are all sorts of things that that play into this. So we see higher rates of depression, we see higher rates of anxiety, social anxiety, um, attention difficulties. And so this is a really difficult illness. You know, a powerful study that came out a while ago looked at quality of life in kids across a lot of different illnesses. And children with obesity had as poor quality of life as kids with cancer. And when you think about how powerful of a message that is and how difficult, because they're not getting support and appreciation and understanding that they're living with a difficult disease. Um, and that really does affect these kids. That is a, a jarring statistic. Um, I would, I guess next we would like to ask, um, is counseling um, a form of intervention that you typically use for uh, patients with obesity? And how do you um, incorporate, if at all, family into this model? Those are great questions. Therapy and counseling can be really helpful components of care for obesity, certainly if kids are struggling with depression or anxiety or disordered eating, like restricting too much, skipping too many meals, um, trying to get rid of food that they've eaten in unhealthful ways. Um, that really does merit psychological care. You do need treatment for those particular disorders in the way that you'd need treatment for other types of diseases. So that's really important. 
But above and beyond that, even for kids who are doing quite well, and I also want to make the point that so many kids that we see who are struggling with obesity are doing amazing in every aspect of their of their lives. Um, and so it's not every kid who needs sort of that higher level of care. But psychologists are experts in behavior change and making some of these lifelong habit changes is so hard. If it weren't hard, then none of us would struggle with it. Um, and so seeing a psychologist can really be helpful if you're feeling stuck and just need someone to help you with motivation or problem solving or, or some specific things, psychologists can be really good at that. And you make an excellent point that it has to be a family-based thing. Um, making these changes is hard for anyone and expecting a child or teenager just to make the right choice when they're you know, going to 7-Eleven with their friends after school and their friends are buying chips and they're like, oh, I better get the carrot sticks and ranch dressing from the you know, the one little, you know, refrigerated section in the back, you know, you can't really ask kids to, to do that. That's hard for anybody. So anything that can be done as a family is really important. And I think sending the message to kids that health is important for everyone in the family because you love each other and care for each other. And that it's not about a specific size or appearance is a really important thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Mackey. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Mm -hmm. So there's a health fair being held in Carla's neighborhood at a local school, and she decides to go. Carla's now seeing how her childhood habits have seeped into her adult life, and she wants to be armed with the proper tools and resources to raise her unborn child. Upon entering the gym, she immediately encounters the table of nutritionist, Ms. Angela Baudou. Ms. Baudou, what constitutes a healthy diet? Well, definitely, let's first talk about diet in terms of eating pattern, right? So not necessarily diet like South Beach or Atkins diet for the, the purpose of losing weight, but for a, a eating pattern that would last a lifetime. So in general, we look at our different food groups, making sure that we're having a balance of fruits and vegetables, of grains, of lean proteins and dairy products, um, beverages that are primarily water and nothing sugar sweetened that are in an appropriate portion spread throughout our day to fuel our activity. So healthy, a healthy eating pattern is, is one that's all encompassing of healthy foods, but also certain indulgences every once in a while. It's just important to know the frequency of that and how much, how often, and making sure that we're getting a good balance of everything. So we have to say heart healthy. What, what does that mean? Right. Well, to me, healthy eating and heart healthy eating are one and the same, right? We should always be striving for a eating pattern that is going to help the health of our most vital organ. But usually when dietitians or nutritionists talk about a heart healthy eating pattern, they're doing so with the intention to improve certain lab results. So like our cholesterol levels, our triglyceride levels, maybe our blood pressure. So different facets of heart disease is then what we want to focus on. So we're a little bit more specific in the types of foods that we want to avoid and that we want to incorporate in our eating pattern. So I mentioned fruits and vegetables being bountiful with a healthy eating pattern in general, but with a heart healthy eating pattern, we definitely wanna have one that is high fiber. So I often say choose fruits and vegetables with an edible skin so that you get all of that good nutrition um, and that's dark in its color, dark in its hue um, as well. Fiber and all the vitamins and minerals that you can get from those, um, those two food groups. With grains, absolutely we wanna make sure that they're whole grains, right? So brown rice and quinoa and bulgur and oats and making sure that that's in our eating pattern and at our meals and snack times in abundance so that we can get, again, that fiber that's really helpful to lowering our cholesterol levels. When we look at our protein sources, so having those um, proteins that are lower in saturated fat, so looking at maybe beans and legumes um, and less of maybe animal proteins that are higher in fat, so the process meats and like bacon or sausage, um, you know, maybe the turkey or chicken with skin, maybe if we had it without skin and we baked or broiled or, or roasted or steamed as opposed to fried our proteins, that's going to be a better option. Maybe doing more plant-based 
proteins is something that can be done as well if that's a, a family choice that wants to be made. So we just get more specific with the type of foods that we recommend with the intention of really trying to improve our, our, um, our heart health and our cholesterol levels. And then also sodium, I mentioned with blood pressure. So choosing foods that we can season or that are seasoned with herbs and spices or products like Mrs. Dash that are blends, seasoning blends that don't have that added salt. Um, but you can also flavor with, you know, garlic powder, onion powder, actual onions. I love onions and put it in everything I can. And you still get kind of that same taste that you would from salt without having it there. So heart healthy just means looking at changes in how we prepare our foods, how we flavor our foods, and a little bit more intentional about exactly what we choose. So they're lower in saturated fat and high in fiber. Wow. So being more conscientious about what I'm eating, I have to know how to read these food labels that are on packages. How do I do that? Definitely, because it can be interesting um, when you look at the front of the label and a product, and then you turn it over and look at exactly what's going on inside. Um, an example can be a lot of like green drinks that you would think are chock full of, you know, broccoli and spinach and all the green vegetables in the world. You turn it around, you look at how much added sugars in there. You look at the, the first ingredient is not spinach at all, but it may be some kind of, of juice. Um, you know, we heard a little bit earlier that when you remove, you know, the pulp and, and the skin of these fruits and then it's juice, that, that sugar is very impactful to our health. And so we want that fiber and we want those things. So when we look at a nutrition label as the one here, we first have to look at serving size, okay? We have to know exactly the amount that all of these, um, that all this information is, is going to. So a half a cup is, is what a serving is, okay? So when you look at, you know, the, the total fat, when you look at sodium, cholesterol, all of that is only in a half cup portion. But if you're eating the entire, you know, package or the in entire um, container, then you have to multiply all these numbers by 15 in this instance. And so it's really important to see what a serving size is. So you know what you're getting, because that's what the nutrition facts are based on. So that's first and foremost. Next, you want to look at, like I said, the nutrition. So total fats, cholesterol, sodium. So these are maximums. You really want to make sure to get as little of this as we can in our eating pattern. So you're looking at these numbers, looking for where we can make some reductions. So here we have choosing foods that are less than two grams of, of saturated fat and have no trans fats at all, right? So this product is not doing too bad, right? So that's what we wanna look for. If we go to the next slide, we can see um, our total carbohydrates. Right. So especially for those who are maybe on a carbohydrate controlled um, meal pattern, like those with diabetes have to be more cognizant of their um, of their total carbohydrate and sugars. But even when we're talking about heart health, you know, like triglycerides, you have to be very mindful of our added sugars. Um, I mentioned fiber a couple of times being so integral in helping us improve our cholesterol scores. So you get that information from here and little notes like choosing um, foods that are less than 10 grams of sugar, the lower we can get on these added sugars, the better. And that are at least three grams of, um, of fiber per serving would be really helpful as well. We want to make sure that our foods in our heart healthy eating pattern or our just healthy overall healthy eating pattern um, is, is bountiful, nutrient dense. That's what we use. So when you see, you know, vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, all of those things, um, you want to make sure that those numbers are high because that's where we, that's where our nutrition's coming from. Right. And then lastly, what you want to look for, it's kind of on, on the uh, side, these percentages are daily values. Okay. And these daily values are based on how much or of these nutri nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients um, fits into a 2000 calorie diet. Okay. And so be mindful that 2000 calories is, is an adult average, not a child, not an infant for sure. So this is what the, um, the food labels want us to look at and to make those decisions um, based on what the information that we have here. So if we can look at these five areas plus the ingredients list, just to make sure what you're getting is what you're getting, then that would be a great place to start. Awesome. And tell me why, why, what's the barriers to eating healthy? Why is it so hard to eat well? 
Yeah, and it's been mentioned a couple times. Uh, Dr. Mackey even mentioned, you know, it's it's access a lot of times. Um, it's and that can be like physical access, like transportation, and that was something that Carla and her family in her history had been an issue to getting to the the farmers market or the stores that have you know these healthy foods, these fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lean proteins. If they even have you know these types of stores available in their community, right? So food deserts and food insecurity are huge barriers. Um, to um, being able to eat healthy, um, in addition to knowledge. It's it, just a food label and how to dissect that, you know, if you don't have a dietitian or a nutritionist helping you figure out, you know, the terms that are on the, the screen that are, are regulated, you know, by our labeling um, governing body, but they actually mean things like when they put healthy and lean and more and free and low, they actually mean things they are attached to, to, to numbers um, that we want to be cognizant of. So knowledge, access, um, we mentioned just stress, right, can be a barrier, um, you know, social stigma. I've had patients that have said, I tried to get a salad at, you know, at the lunch table and they mocked me because they said, that's not what you eat. Who are you fooling? <laughs> right. And so it, it, there's shame there too, with um, eating in public and trying to eat healthy. If you have the access to begin with and the finances, you know, to, to, to be able to purchase these foods, but there are definitely a lot of programs, definitely a lot of, of resources that can help us with these barriers and support systems as well. And how does someone access someone like you, a dietitian, a registered dietitian, nutritionist? Yeah. How we so, so we have, um, there's a, a number of different places, right? Usually our referrals come from uh, pediatricians, primary care offices. So if there is um, usually a concern, it's can be identified with them. And then they may have places to refer to at a hospital or a clinic or even a community um, based center. So that can be a, a first place to start. Uh, other families or, or um, individuals may look at their um, insurance companies, right? And, and what their benefits look like. Contact them and see if a nutritionist is, is someone that they can access if they, they have private insurance um, or what wellness programs that they can get through their, their employer. That's another route. You can go to a local gym. A lot of gyms um, have dietitians and nutritionists that are, are, are part of their facilities, um, even, you know, different community centers. Um, so there's definitely different places that you can go to, even um, searching on, let's say, uh, eatright.org. So eatright.org is the official website of the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics, which I'm a part of. They have a button, find a dietitian. You put in your zip code and a bunch come up, you know, so there's definitely a lot of different ways that you can try to access um, a dietitian such as myself. Great. And can you tell us about the ideal clinic? This was something that was mentioned by one of our earlier panelists. What is that? Yeah, absolutely. So the ideal clinic is a multidisciplinary medical, medically supervised clinic at Children's National and how I got my start at, at the hospital. So it is um, made up of dietitians like myself, health educators who do a lot of family um, counseling and kind of help families with communication. Um, also medical providers, whether it's a nurse practitioner or a, um, you know, a physician or, or um, pediatrician. And we all work together in an effort of lifestyle change, which was also mentioned before. Setting individualized goals for physical activity, for healthy eating, so that we're able to improve our health and our overall well-being. Also, we will, you know, um, reach out to psychology. We'll We'll reach out to endocrinology, cardiology. It's a network um, that really wants to work together for every person, every patient that comes through and their families. Every appointment has a patient, you know, um, the child or the teen and their family and their parent. It could be their grandparent. It can be their auntie, their godmother. We will invite anybody into the room because we know that the, it does take a village and we know that we have to um, include everybody in making lifestyle changes. So we have the environment at home um, that supports that kind of eating. So regular visits with the team every time that you come in to be strategic about about the progression of, of treatment. Again, mainly lifestyle change and that kind of counseling with healthy eating from the dietitian, but sometimes it becomes um, needing more intensive therapies like um, pharmacotherapy or even working with bariatric surgery, which we do as well. Thank you. So it truly is a team effort. 
and getting our kids healthy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time. So then Carla, thanks, Miss Bodu. And she sees a table labeled Green Fair Organic Cafe with its CEO, Ms. Gwen Whitaker, standing by. Ms. Whitaker, what does your cafe specialize in? Annette, thank you for having me on your program. I opened Green Fair Organic Cafe as a restaurant to show people uh, the optimal way to eat. So most restaurants are going to make food that is um, tasty tasty and um, inexpensive. Um, and what we do is we look at um, foods that don't need uh, nutrition facts label. They're made from fresh produce that's organic and then without added salt, oil, and sugar. So we have a plant-based restaurant that uh, is filled with books where people can come and have a great meal as well as take a program that we offer um, that provides uh, classes and food. Uh, we partner with doctors and watch patients reverse, usually things like high blood pressure in a couple of days, high cholesterol in a couple of weeks. And we've shown that you can reverse uh, type two diabetes with a, a, a plan of healthy eating on a low fat plant-based diet uh, within a, within a, usually a month period. So, um, we usually do blood testing in our program. So people actually see some biometrics along with what they're doing. And I think there's been a lot of discussion with your doctors about a healthy lifestyle. We try to actually help enable that by making it easy for people to learn, um, the skills about how to, how to prepare meals, uh, that are helpful as well as delicious at home. Um, I think the probably one of the biggest challenges is people are time stressed these days. So they look for uh, convenient food, either dry, drive through or processed foods. And those foods tend to be very high in um, fat, saturated fat, um, added salt, and, um, and, and also usually sugar. So when you take those things out, people's health usually re, re, um, returns. Thank you. And what, if you could, Ms. Whitaker, tell us what's the different, difference between plant-based versus vegan versus vegetarian? Are they all the same? Could you just educate us a little bit about sure. that? Sure. So originally, um, vegetarians were people that ate only vegetables. And then um, what happened is it sort of evolved. People started bringing dairy and eggs back into their diet. And so uh, the vegan term was coined, which basically is more of an ethical position where uh, people don't, uh, not only don't eat animal products, they don't buy leather or uh, consume things or use things that uh, are made with animal products. So I tend to use the term plant-based and I think um, of local survey surveys that have been done, 65% of Americans are willing to eat a plant-based meal. Um, the vegan percentage is usually very small. It's, it's on the order of three to 4%. So usually um, in context, I always say, um, you know, plant-based striving for the most plant-based um, uh, meal is gonna be, is gonna be um, ideal. The food industry has discovered that uh, there's a growing interest in plant-based nutrition and the vegan lifestyle. And so there's all kinds of products out there now, like I'm sure everybody's heard of the Beyond Meat Burger and the Impossible Burger and the vegan cheeses and all of those products are the food industry trying to exploit this new uh, growth area. And they're not healthful products. They're uh, they are food-like products. They're made usually with a lot of salt and oil. So we see people that are on those type of, um, you know, a vegan diet doesn't necessarily mean a healthy diet these days. So then is plant-based eating tasteless soy products? Because I see these two meals here and they look great. Uh, so the, the meal that's on your right is our um, mac and no cheese. It's actually a cashew-based cheese sauce. 
Um, we uh, do actually do a macro nutrient analysis of all of the di dishes that we prepare at Green Fair, um, which is the protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And uh, we strive to do the amount of protein that has been shown to be ideal. Most Americans eat way too much protein, which uh, gets stored just as much as fat. Any excess macronutrients get stored as fat. So uh, when you eat too much protein, um, you, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, so uh, protein is usually on the order of eight to 10%. Fat is less than 20% in complex carbohydrates. You see some uh, delicious whole grain pasta there uh, with some uh, fresh broccoli and it's got uh, organic whole grain wheat crumbs on top of it. And then a, a spaghetti marinara with some awesome mushrooms, um, eating mushrooms, which are um, uh, usually not considered on a plant-based diet because they're fungi, which is not um, a plant, but a um, kingdom unto itself but mushrooms in your diet actually um, increase long, longevity and decrease um, uh, exposure to cancer. So it's great to include uh, mushrooms in your diet. And are, are your meals kid-friendly? Do kids tend to try this and, and like this? Yeah, it's sort of interesting kid-friendly because most restaurants, if you go in and you get the kid's menu, it's like the worst of the worst. You know, it's whether it's chicken fingers or I don't have kids myself, but I, I, you know, know that most things are fried or salted and um, it's not really food. Um, so the meals that we have for kids at Green Fair are things that are on our main menu that tend to be not quite as, um, usually not quite as spicy because kids tend to be more sensitive to that. Um, so we have things like lemon pepper, pepper broccoli, the mac and cheese. Uh, we have a banana and peanut butter sandwich. So some things that are very simple things where you can look at each dish and you know what, what is going into it. And everything is freshly prepared. Um, most restaurants these days are not getting produce trucks at the back. They're getting uh, boxes of frozen food that they thaw out. Um, add oil and salt to, and then serve to the table. So it's not good for kids either. Thank you so much, Ms. Okay. Whitaker. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh -huh. All righty. So after speaking and being at the her fair, um, Carla has just gained so much knowledge at the fair in regard to her diet, but she knows that staying indoors a lot um, was not good for her either. Um, she looks across the gym and she sees a Dr. Wally Govan, not just talking the talk, but exercising, about exercising, but also walking the walk. She walks over to his table and marvels at pics of his fitness journey. So Dr. Govan, not only are you a pediatric cardiologist, but you are a huge fitness guru. You've built a gym in your clinics. Uh, why did you see this as a need a need to do thank you for inviting me to this to this discussion so i mean i i love fitness and um you know it's just something that i always wanted to share with kids and when we got into quarantine and children just you know life stopped for a lot of people and you know kids were coming back to the clinic 20 30 pounds than when i previously saw them and also the way that my clinics are built they're multi-special clinics so i work with general pediatricians and so I was watching, and they were talking about these patients that came back 15, 20, 30, some kids 50, 60 pounds in a year and a half. And so I was like, well, you know, we have to start living in this new world. And I, you know, started thinking about what we can do because all gyms were closed, sports activities had stopped, and, you know, parents were just getting frustrated. And I have a personal trainer myself and who didn't have a job. And so I was like, well, <laughs> let's figure out how we can kind of partner together. And so I, you know, we cut out two patient rooms and built a little personal fitness studio for the kids to work out there. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're private, so it's not group, you know, especially a lot of kids, they may be embarrassed to work out with other people. And so we really try to set it out so that it can be a comfortable and safe environment for them. 
to Dr. Gavin, why is exercise so important? And in general, how does it combat obesity? I mean, it's important. Just It helps kids to just, just move. And, um, you know, the sitting down all day, you just want to sit down some more. Moving around, you're going to feel a little bit motivated to do something. And I always tell I tell everybody who wants to work out, motivation is gonna come after you start moving. It's not gonna come before. And so you just have to make an active active decision to decide what you wanna do. And then once you decide to do it, you just have to kind of just just move forward without a second thought. You know, no excuse, is it raining? It doesn't matter. Is it snowing? Doesn't matter. You just have to figure out a way to do it. You know, as we spoke about earlier in the discussion, there were a lot of barriers to kids. And I just tell kids, use use the space that you have. You know, you can do sit-ups, you can do push-ups, you can do squats and those are some of the things that we do with the kids in the clinic and i always invite the families so we you know we have a very affordable model for um for the for the children and their families to work out and i definitely encourage the parents to work out with the kids so it's not just the child working out if a child has a sibling and a sibling wants to work out they can work out but i definitely encourage whoever brings a child to work out with them and i know as an adult, it's difficult to exercise. <laughs> Why is it also hard for children to exercise and how do you uh, combat this challenge by keeping them motivated? So I try to make it very, very positive for everybody. You know, you go to the gym sometimes, you hear somebody yelling, one more, just keep it moving. You know, and that's not, that's not our model. Our model is to make it positive, you know, such that when you come in, even if you gain the pound, it's not shaming you. It's just sorting out what's the situation. What are some of the barriers that you are facing at home? Are you being bullied? Are you depressed? Are you anxious? You know, a lot of the times we simply just address what they're eating and are they exercising, but we never bother to ask them, do you have any friends? Are you getting along with your family? And whenever I see somebody who has gained typically more than 20, 30 pounds in a year, invariably there is some mental illness that's going on. And so I have to directly ask, are your parents, are your parents being separated? Um, are you enduring anything in the house that you may be a little bit embarrassed to discuss? And you know, usually they'll, they'll open up to you. And so I use this exercise as a, as a positive thing because you're not just sitting there listening to me talk to you for 20, 30 minutes, um, you're moving around. And so while you're moving around, I get to engage your, you know, your mom or your dad and it just makes it a much more active discussion. And also it, it, it removes a barrier because it lowers their guard right? because they're exercising, right? So they're not thinking about what might come out their mouth as they're breathing heavily, but, you, but they'll speak very freely. And once you say that you care, once they, once they know that you care about them, they're much more you know, easy to just kind of say things that they might have never said to anybody, right? And so I usually see the kids on a, on a weekly basis, just like a personal trainer would, or actually I work with a professional bodybuilder in one of the clinics and I'll see them once a week and, you know, they just kind of open up. And so you may open up to your physician. So we have a bodybuilder, they may open up to him, you know, it doesn't matter who you end up speaking to, as long as we can understand exactly what's going on with the family dynamics, what's going on with your mental health. And then, you know, re- the information is kind of relayed and we can get you the help that you need. There's a lot of kids out there who are suffering through depression, anxiety, and they're suicidal, you know, and here we are sometimes just talking about broccoli and spinach and you're busy dying inside, you know, cutting your arm, you know, that people don't even know about. And so by doing exercise and helping kids to feel good, they're going to, they typically want to share because they want to do better. So even if a kid loses half a pound, I mean, it's like the, Hey, you gained 20 pounds over the last year, you lost half a pound. Let's, let's take glory in, in that and let's be appreciative of that. And so it helps them to build their self-confidence as well. Oh, hey, doc, you know, I noticed my pants are getting looser. Oh, I feel so good about that, you know? And so it just helps them on their journey as well. And it's a very personal journey for, you know, adults. It's a personal journey for children. And the parents, you know, they feel good to see their child healthy. No parent wants to hear that their child has high cholesterol, pre-diabetes, diabetes, high blood pressure. And so the parents start to feel good as well. So everybody starts to feel good. And we make it a family model. So it's not just telling the kid not to do this and that. It's really engaging the family without judgment that change is possible. If you just do 1% more than what you did yesterday, you may get a 1% change tomorrow. That's beautiful. Have you noted um, a lot of success in patients? And success can be not defined by the amount of weight loss, but uh, whether it's emotional 
uh, spiritual success in uh, patients whose families are also engaged in yeah. um, their exer- in your exercise program. For sure. And I love the fact that you said, you know, not weight loss, because I don't really focus on weight. I focus on the entire individual. You know, it's, it's I ask them, how do you feel? Right. And when they say, you know, I feel be- that to me is a sign of success in, in my program. Somebody went from being sad, depressed, and now they're feeling a little better because I also, if they tell me they're depressed or I get signs of depression, I'll send them to, you know, therapy and throw through the combination of therapy, through the combination of their nutrition or dietitian. And now with the exercise portion of it, um, they start to feel better. They start to notice their clothes looser or sometimes when they run, whereas they ran for one minute and now they're out of breath and now they can run much longer. And those are all positive indicators that we can use for them that look, it's it's working. You may not notice a 10 pound drop, which is what you think is gonna happen because you're looking at Instagram and Facebook and that's what you think is gonna happen, but it's gonna take you know some work. So if you wanna lose a 10 pounds, let's put in 1% more effort. And can you give us um, an example of a typical exercise prescription that you yeah. give to some of your patients? So a lot of it's calisthenics. We, you know, and as I mentioned before, it's squats, it's lunges, it's sit-ups, it's it's uh, push-ups, it's planks. We don't really use weights for the children. We just want them to use, use their body weight because we don't want parents going out to buy equipment. You know, a lot of adults buy equipment, they just kind of just put it to the side. And I tell people, look, you have your own body to use and we can just make natural use of that. And I tell them, look, how many days can you commit? Some people are like one. I said, fine, okay, if you you pick one day, you chose it, I didn't choose it for you. We're gonna commit to that one day. They come back, they gain a pound. I said, well, is there anything that you're willing to commit to? You know what, Doc, I might do three days this week. Okay, well, so I get them to decide what they want to do through, you know, a little bit of tactics here and there, but I want it to come from them because it's like anything in life. If you have to tell somebody to do it, there's going to be some hesitation, but if I can get you to realize that you can do it. And if you want the result that you desire and it's possible, you're going to want to go a little bit further to get it. And it's a process. It's not, you know, I have to tell people, look, I have to take care of some kids for like two months. They gain 10 pounds initially. I don't, and then and they don't want to come back. But invariably, after the third month, they actually, Doc, I want to come back. You know, I get them to do jump rope. So some kids can't even do one jump rope by the time up to two or three months. So they're, they're coming in. They're the ones picking up the jump rope such that by the time I even walk into the room, they're already jumping rope. And then up to like, you know, 40, 50 or 60 jump rope. And that makes them feel good that they can show their parents, that they can show me as an, you know, the accountability factor that things are actually improving for them. So I love what I do. Thank you so much, Dr. Galvin, for your mental model. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galvin. So Carla thanks Dr. Galvin for his time and makes her way to a recognizable face in her community. It's community physician, Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan. After receiving congrats on her pregnancy from Dr. Lewis Raglan, Carla asks, Dr. Lewis Raglan, you are out here in these streets as a pediatrician living and working in our underserved communities. What are you seeing out in the community regarding obesity? Well, thank you for having me. Um, And everyone has been, it's just been an excellent discussion. So when I see Carla, I get excited because I get excited about seeing my families and I actually often see them um, at things like uh, health fairs and um, particularly I see them in the grocery store. (laughs) And when I see them in the grocery store, um, I get a chance to um, I get a chance to see sometimes what's in the uh, what's in those grocery carts. Um, and the first thing they do is sort of say to me, oh, yes, we talked about this. You know, I've actually had the opportunity to walk my families around um, grocery stores. I do grocery store tours and tell them how they need to sort of stick to the perimeter Um, and, you know, how to um, choose healthy fruits and vegetables to be as conscious about plant-based as possible. So one of the things that I've been seeing, and I think Dr. Um, Klaus and even Dr. Um, Gavin has already uh, sort of mentioned it, is that since the pandemic, we've seen um, a lot of of growth, (laughs) Um, not sort of, not that that height, (laughs) vertical growth, but this horizontal. Um, We've been seeing... um, our kids are gaining um, weight because of 
the pandemic because they're not as active because again, they're not moving around, going to classes, moving when we were at least sitting at home. Some are still wanting to choose to, to be virtual. So we're, as pediatricians, we're encouraging them to get back and, and have a, a normal um, routine and to get active. But we definitely saw an increase in, um, in weight. But in some communities, you know, this was already a problem. I think uh, it was Dr. Midas Snyder that said, you know, about half of Americans, especially adults, are overweight. Well, that trend is, is the same here in, in D.C. But interestingly, in our Ward 7 and 8, it actually trends upwards to 72 percent of the adults are um, overweight or, or have obesity um, in, in communities where what I think is contributing to it um, are health, um, are food deserts. Um, I think I like the, the term food swamps. Uh, we say food deserts and it implies that there's no food available. But a lot of times when we talk about a food swamp, it's just that the foods that are available aren't very healthy. Um, they aren't nutrient dense. Um, there's a lot of fast foods in, in, in a small um, area, in a small um, vicinity. And one of the things that I love about Dr. Govan and what he's been able to do is he's put together um, and provided activity exercise for these kids who oftentimes in our communities don't have a safe place um, to, to exercise, to get physical activity. And the, and the other thing is, when do they have the opportunity to do this with their parents, right? With families in um, gym, someone mentioned, you know, going to a gym um, to get some information about nutrition and nutritionists, but oftentimes the gyms have, a, have an age limit. Um, and many of the gyms have an age limit of 16 or, or above. So it does, it, it makes it difficult for those kids to get access what I love about my community, I'm, I'm in um, Ward 8 at the Art. We have the Boys and Girls Club. So I'm often making sure to give, um, you know, a prescription, if you will, to, to get involved, to get on team sports. I think it's difficult to be um, motivated by yourself. I know as an adult, it's difficult to be motivated by myself. So when I have someone to uh, exercise with, well, with kids, at least they can get in, involved in team sports. But as is, but Dr. Gavin brought up a good point. When you're um, overweight, or when the kids have obesity that they're that they're suffering from, then they're embarrassed to be involved in some of these um, teams and team sports. So anything that we can do to get them active, we we will. But definitely in my community, I'm seeing that it's a definitely that the uh, obesity has increased since the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it that's contributing to it, besides the food um, swamps, if you will, and lack of activity, is some the underlying thread I think we've all talked about are the stressors, you know, in these communities, especially in my community. There's high unemployment, which of course got worse with COVID. Um, there's, um, you know, domestic violence, there's, you know, substance abuse. Um, there's gun violence. There's a lot of things that these kids are dealing with on a daily basis. And as, as Dr. Gavin said, when we want to talk to them about spinach and broccoli, um, but they're juggling so many other uh, factors that's going on in their lives, um, we have to recognize this isn't an individual problem. This is a community problem. Because I just said, if it's a, upwards of 72% in a community, in these communities like wards seven and eight, then this isn't just a couple of people that are suffering. These are whole communities are suffering. And so we're gonna to need to do something about that. Thank you, Dr. Lewis Franklin. What policies should be put in place at the local, state or federal level to help decrease obesity? So I think we're, it's all about food access. I think that right now, for instance, one of the places that um, we could be more effective is um, you know, we've been tackling school lunch programs for a while. So I think we still just have a lot of work to do. I think we need to get some good folks in there, some, some Angela's and some folks in there to really help them with, um, and, and Gwen over here to help them with the food choices, make these, um, make these options tasty, make these options fun for kids. 
um, because they do need to be introduced to better food options. Um, I think that, you know, we should have some policies around, um, this is, I'm, I'm old school, so vending machines and, and, and you know, sodas, availability of, of those things in schools. You know, I think that we should have some policies around removing those, um, those things because it's very difficult for kids not to partake. I think someone gave an example of, you know, when all the kids go to 7-Eleven and they're picking up things and the, it's a child who wants to do so. If this is something that's available at your school and it's ready, readily available, then you're going to um, you're going to partake. And it isn't always the, the right choices. It's hard to make those right choices as an adult. So definitely difficult for um, for kids to consistently make um, good choices. But we have to make it available. So some of our, our programs, I think some of the things that have been good that we've been doing is that we've made um, some of our local farmer markets. Um, they've been, um, you know, sort of interfaced with some of the social programs. So um, WIC and uh, SNAP, you know, we've been able to um, allow them to use their EBT um, funds to purchase foods. But we have to do a lot more of that because we are all talking about how difficult it is, but it's so expensive. It's so expensive to eat um, healthy. And, and it is and it isn't relatively, again, if we don't make the change, then it's going to cost us more in our health in the end. Mm-hmm. So we have to figure out how to uh, teach people. One of the reasons I do grocery store tours and walk them around the perimeter is teaching them that a lot of the things that you get around the perimeter are actually a lot cheaper <laughs> and they go and they go a lot further in, in a family than the processed foods, the highly um, processed, lots of sugar, but no, no nutrients. Um, but again, it's hard to combat when you walk into the store and you have 10 for 10, you know, meeting you, greeting you at the door, um, with um, pastries or cookies, you know, things like that, chips that are 10 for 10. The first thing they start thinking about is their wallet and, and how far their, their, um, their st- the funds that they have can go in feeding their family. So there's a lot more education and a lot more policies that need to be put into place that allow um, funds to be used and utilized in, in places. And I think that we need to start figuring out how to how to regulate some of these prices. We've all talking about the inflation's up 7, 7.2%. Those of us who have the capability of, use, of our funds and money are feeling it. Imagine how these families are, are suffering as we're still trying to have this conversation about eating right and, and, and exercise. And it's, it's just one more stressor that they're now dealing with. And we just talked about the fact that stress is also part of the problem. So we just have to do better. I think we're doing a, a, you know, a pretty good job in some areas, but we have to do better. And briefly, Dr. Lewis Ragland, tell us about your red carpet affair. Yeah, so this is it's exciting. Um, as a community member, one of the things that I recognize is that um, like Dr. Gavin, we need to sort of get in the trenches. I guess this is the, the Peace Corps volunteer in me <laughs> and um, doing things at a grassroots level, but really kind of showing and, and telling as opposed to just um, educating. It's, education is very important, but how do you educate? So I use this an annual program. This is my fourth annual, uh, my fourth year. And we do something through edutainment as educating through entertainment where I have um, young people actually a part of this conversation because I truly believe that the conversation should start there. Um, We were, someone was talking about the fact that it's the young women who have heart disease. And I think it's the American Heart Association that says 49% of African-American women have heart disease by age 20. So it was important to me that we had um, some programming that got children involved teaching and educating and really getting the conversation started with their parents. Because I think it's a twofold message. One is they want us as parents to be around, to see them and watch them grow up and, 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 and experience the things that they're experiencing. So, so us dying early is not, is not co- conducive to that, right? But the second part of it is we need to, uh, we need to model the behaviors for our kids 
that are going to um, help mitigate and pre or, or prevent heart disease. So exercise. So I, I, I bring in um, yoga, um, different types of exercise. We do meditation for decreasing stress. I have a heart healthy um, meals. They get, you know, and everything is free. Um, and they get um, uh, the American Heart Association provides um, free uh, cookbooks with heart healthy recipes because it's all about um, the the practical tips that are actually going to change their lives on a daily basis. And so that's very important for me that we sort of do this on a community level, do this for the families and give them some practical ways that they can get involved in eating right exercising and reducing stress. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis Ragland. Turn it over to, to Dr. O'Guiri. So after hearing from all of you, Carla is feeling empowered to lead a heart healthy lifestyle for her unborn child. She thinks if only her family had similar support as they were raising her, things might have been a little bit different Though she is a high-risk pregnancy, she has faith in her medical team that listens to her, that all will eventually be well for both herself and for her baby. Thank you all for uh, joining us um, and going through this case about Carla and her life. Great. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, and to our attendees who are listening on Facebook Live and in the session as well, um, maybe a minute <laughs> to ask. Uh, uh, if anyone has a burning question, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, we're going to start closing um, the session. Uh, but before doing so, I did want to um, pay homage. Well, mo the majority of us on this panel are pediatric cardiologists and it's Black History Month. So a slide honoring those who came before us, before me. Um, some of the pediatric cardiologists and adult cardiology people who contrib contributed to pediatric cardiology, um, past and current. And then this is uh, the next slide is a uh, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He's actually an African American adult cardiologist who's contributed a lot to the plant based world as well. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Bond. Thank you, Dr. Ansong, and thank you so much, Dr. Aguari, and all of the panelists for such an amazing discussion. I, I really think that what we wanted to intend with this webinar is the importance of early education and early prevention. Because again, what happens during our childhood actually impacts us throughout our entire life course. So here are a few resources, um, including the Association of Black Cardiologists website, amongst a few others, ranging from the American Ca Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Cardiology, and the American Heart Association, as well as some impactful resources discussed today that all of you, we encourage you to join and definitely peruse at your leisure. Um, as you heard from Dr. Albert earlier on, we currently are right now in the month of February, which is not only Black History Month, but it's Heart Health Month. And as a result of that, we launched a campaign called We Are the Faces of Black Maternal Health. Really, the premise of it is exactly what we discussed with, uh, with Carla's case, which is, again, what we do during our childhood may impact us as adults, specifically during our reproductive years, such as pregnancy. So if you'd like more information for this movement or you'd like to join in the movement with us, please go to wearethefaces.abcardio.org. And we have a few uh, really engaging and interesting upcoming things for the month of February through our Women and Children's Committee. One will be our inaugural hot cocoa with hot shots where we're looking to really highlight particularly uh, people of color in the cardiovascular field or those that are affiliated with the cardiovascular field for both pediatric as well as adult. This upcoming Hot Cocoa with Hot Shots will actually uh, talk to Dr. Demi, who is a physician at uh, Mayo Clinic in Florida, who does a lot of artificial intelligence. And specifically, the discussion will be on her research that's focusing on a condition called peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is a weakening of the heart muscle that does occur during pregnancy. 
we're really excited that it will be moderated by one of our cardiology fellows at UCSF, who's Dr. Joyce Deroge. And of course, Dr. Ansung and myself will be included as well. And for those on the call who are not too familiar with the Association of Black Cardiologists, we would love for you to get familiar. There is opportunity for you to apply for membership. You do not have to be a physician and there's also opportunity to donate. So we could do more amazing and fantastic programs like this. I think the premise of the ABC is that we like to get to the community and we really are engaged with our community leaders, but more importantly, those within the community that really, I think, can use these tools without a doubt. So uh, as mentioned, please consider going to the website, um, joining as a member or pot potentially helping us to sponsor another one of these amazing events. I just want to add, you also don't have to be Black to be part of the Association of Black Cardiologists. Yes, absolutely. We have a wider range of uh, people coming from many different race ethnicities, as well as different gender and sexes. And with that, thank you all so much. Um, we look forward to our next upcoming, upcoming table talk in the next uh, few months or so. Happy Heart Month, everyone. Thank you, everyone.